welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Final Hustle Podcast. From you know the face and you hear the voice, you know it's Javon, and I'm back with another one-on-one with Javon. And today we have one of the pioneers in this content creation thing. One of the best to ever do it. Eunice Talks Football. Or just Eunice. Welcome, brother. How are you doing? Yes, my bro. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Nice intro. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was going to go on this long spiel. But if you haven't, if you're in Chelsea, if you're in the Chelsea content space, just watching or making content yourself and you don't know about Eunice, then you must live under a rock. Because I'm fairly new to this and I've learned a lot about Eunice without talking to Eunice because Eunice has been one on the, one of the first names being brought up when we talk to some of these content creators. But let me not tell his story. He's here to tell his story. So Eunice, what well, go on, brother? Oh, good. Yeah, man. Um, no, it's true. It's true. And we'll, we'll get into all of that as well. Um, but it's been a pleasure as well, like uh, with what we're doing with All You Can Eat Chelsea. And um, we've uh, we've spoken much more at length now. And yeah, that's why when you was like, yo, I'm going to be bringing people on. Come on. I'm like, yeah, it's got to be done. It's got to be done. So thank you for having me. I appreciate no it. No problem. Thank you for being here. <laughs> no, no problem, thing. No so I'm going to get right into it. I always start with a question. Give us your perception of how you fell in love with the club, Chelsea. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I think my story is, um, is not too different from most. Um, I kind of didn't have a choice. You know, I was... Um, so for those that don't know, um, you might tell from, from, from the way that I talk, my accent as well, but I'm, I'm born and bred in London. Um, and I had Chelsea around me. This is why I said I, don't, I really didn't have a choice. I, I'll, I'll say something I've never said on, on anywhere. So you're getting uh, an exclusive here. Yeah? But when I was really small, the first team that I was looking at as, oh, you know, like, because you, you have to pick your team. You're starting to understand what football is at a really young age. I was looking at Man United, mm. right? Okay. And Man United were the big boys then. And um, it was like the, just before like the class of 99 really done their thing and all of that, but United were the big boys. And I remember discovering football for the first time at that age of like four, five, we start to kick a ball properly, start to figure out what the game is. And I remember seeing just Man United for the first time. And I'm just like, they're good. <laughs> So I'm like, you know, that, that was the first team that caught my attention. But with time, my dad is a huge Chelsea fan. Mm-hmm. Um, my best friend for quite a few years at the time, massive Chelsea fan. Uh, we grew up together. Uh, I had another friend who, again, I, I, we're still in touch quite a lot, but he's a Man United fan. So the, this was also part of the dynamic. But um, I had loads of people around me that were Chelsea fans. I had a lot of Chelsea around me, so it kind of started to divert and I started to just get exposed to loads of Chelsea. And then, um, as I said, I'm born and bred in, in South London. Stamford Bridge is not too far. Um, you know, you start to go near the ground. You start to go in the, to, like, to the area. You start to, you're near Fulham Broadway. You're, you get exposed to those sort of things. And yeah, little by little, I didn't have a say in the matter. And then you just realise... You're starting to have blue in your blood, so that was uh, that was it basically. That was it. It starts spreading basically, yeah. So that's how that's how I got into it. Like I said, I didn't really have a say. <laughs> okay, okay. That, yeah, that's typically. I will obviously. I'm not from London, but uh, like I said before, my father is an Arsenal fan, and you know, your father wants to kind of Ooh. impart. Of course, that that knowledge of football and that love of football to you, but uh, my brother, my brother is older than me, and my brother chose United. I'm like, "Eh, nah, I want to go. I want to do this myself. You know, I want to have some form of independence. Choose what I want and who I'm going to suffer with and strive with for the next years. And then Oscar and Barbara came about, and then he came to Chelsea, and then the Hazard effect, and then one thing led to the next. I'm a proper Chelsea. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> welcome. What, man. Was, what was your first experience um, being that Chelsea fan where you said, you know what? This <laughs> is not just a team. This is not just a sport that I occasionally watch like F1. This is life. Yeah. Where, where did that click for you? And what age did that click for you? It felt raw. I remember this. 
the times of Zola, Poyet, that 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 era um, was when Chelsea were not the best, but they were in that mix. But it felt raw. It didn't feel so refined. Like, um, and I think the, the the refinement came probably after Roman bought the club. But before that, it just felt like a um, a really raw community club. You know, and I don't know if maybe that was just the feel of football back then. Maybe other clubs had the same sort of feeling. But with Chelsea, it just felt like um, the result was important, but the the culture was more important. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, and there was a there was a certain identity um, that was always the number one thing. Um, not in the not in terms of how Chelsea were playing. It's not to do with the way that Chelsea were playing. That had nothing to do with it. Just the the fan base and the when you interact with other Chelsea fans, when you interact with the club, you go for the experience on a match day. You do all of that. It was just raw, and I can't explain it. Um, I, that feeling doesn't exist anymore. I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I, as I said, maybe this is just the way football has gone. Maybe it's the modern day, um, but. With Chelsea, it was very, um, like I said, there was a certain identity to it and you just, you went with that. And if you won, if you got results, it was fantastic. And if you didn't, you still enjoyed everything else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so back then was when I started to really understand the culture. And we also have to talk about this. This was a time where... This is why there was a very diehard culture around Chelsea back then, because the the hooligan era was at its peak, right? And it was starting to maybe die down, maybe before it was at its peak, but it was still around. So you still had that feel. And this was just, a, you, there was only a few clubs. I don't think there were other clubs that had this. You know, Chelsea had it. Um, Mill definitely had it. <laughs> West Ham had it. Um, there was a certain feel that other clubs probably didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and that just added to the whole experience, you know? Now, this is why I said back then it was unique because I think this also added a point with the, with the era and the way that the hooliganism was back then. Um, the, the Chelsea firm was still very active, mm -hmm. very active at that time. Um, so let, me you, let me ask you a question. Hola. I want to get a timeline for the people here. Yeah. Are you pre-Roman era? Were you introduced to Chelsea pre-Roman? Pre, pre, yeah, yeah. Whoa! We got another one! We got another one! On <laughs> the, the last episode with well, me. You're just, getting, you're just getting loads of post-2004s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, because you know, come on, Miz. You know the rhetoric around our football club. Of course, there's yeah. Of There's no history. Around. There's no history when there yeah. actually is. There's no, there's none of their fans are pre-Roman. So it's nice to debunk this, this myth within this topic of football. Because, you know, we have other topics. We could talk about the games. We could talk. But to actually get to know these content creators that are on yeah. a global level where their word carries weight, it's different. So when you hear their stories, when they're talking, they know what they're talking about because they're pre-Roman. That's high, yeah. a highly successful era. So... Well, like my clapping is just to say, yes, we do have people on our side that are pre-Roman. It's also sarcasm to say, obviously, you know, for those yeah. people. There's, there, there, there's loads. Um, and uh, sorry for the drill. That's new. <laughs> but um, I, there's a whole perception of that, that there's, oh, yeah, Chelsea have no history. It's post-2004. Uh, nothing existed before that. That doesn't come from a place of um, people genuinely believing there's no history. Everyone knows there were history. That just comes from jealousy of what we did post-2004. What yeah. we did post-2004 was literally take over the scene. Yes. Like Chelsea took things over and people just didn't like it. It's a simple, that's all it comes from. Deep yeah. down, they know Chelsea have history. And we did, and this is what I'm saying. In that time, pre-Roman, um, that 97, 98, 99, into the early 2000s. Even before that, 95, Chelsea were winning things. Yeah. Let's not pretend Chelsea yeah, were not yeah, winning. We were there. Yeah, it was it a was, it was, yeah, th there was the odd cup win. Mm -hmm. You end up 
in a title race. You don't go all the way. Um, we won the Cup Winners' Cup in 97, um, 98, beat Real Madrid in the Super Cup. They were Champions League winners. we done things. This was all pre-Roman. Yeah. Um, and this added to the feel because, it, like I said, it was still raw. Mm. So when you did get a Cup win, it felt incredible Euphoria. because it was raw. Like we... We didn't have resources. There was a bit of resource that was definitely helped by Matthew Harding, for example, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that helped. But when you go through like what Chelsea went through with Save the Bridge, mm -hmm. that, you know, there was the threat of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, Ken Bates bought the club for a pound. All, all of it, you go through that. And not too long after, you're winning the FA Cup. Mm -hmm. um, you win the Cup Winners' Cup. You beat Real Madrid. It, mm -hmm. You feel like you're doing it with nothing. You know what I mean? It felt incredible. Um, but that's all part of the history. And even prior to that, the 70s and what Chelsea done before, th there's a lot of history there. But when Roman came, that's just what people couldn't handle. And they just didn't like it. And they couldn't do anything about it. And this is why they were jealous. It's just jealousy, yeah. that's all. Yeah, because for me, I like to say when Roman came in, the Roman Empire began. But, you know, that's a whole other story. It's like... Hey, the, 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 I remember the tabloids back then, the newspapers. Mm -hmm. From the moment he walked in, mm -hmm. Chelsky became a thing. If you remember Chelsky, yeah. they were calling mm -hmm. Chelsea Chelsky, mm -hmm. right? And trying to like mock and like and make it look quickly, like... Quickly, with the appointment of the special one, all of that flipped on his head. And not just, not just, not just Jose. In, in such a short time, the whole fabric, he come in, Peter Kenyon from Man United. Mm -hmm. That, that was, was huge. That was the marquee. That was, huge. That was, that the, was marquee. the marquee. Mm -hmm. And that was the one that I think a lot of people, not Chelsea fans remember, non-Chelsea fans sweep under the carpet like it was nothing. That was the game changer. When you take, at the time, the best director, mm -hmm. definitely in English football, one of the best in the world, directly under Sir Alex Ferguson's nose from Man United, and you swoop him to Chelsea, that was huge. And then we got Jose in because of it. So, okay. Okay. crazy. So let, me, so let me read back my excitement here. Not my interview. Yeah. Take, me to the, take me through the eyes and the mind of Eunice as a fan at this point, where you see all of this being unfold. Roman bought the club, and then he souped P Peter Kenyon from United. What was going through your head at that time? Um, I I'll be honest. Like, back then, I mean, I was fairly young. So I saw it happening and I was like, this is great, but I didn't understand the magnitude of it. Mm -hmm. Not like I, under, like I would understand it now. Now I would get it like, oh my God, this is mental. But back then, um, 2004, yeah, I was, I was 12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, was, uh, I, I saw it unfolding and I remember thinking, this sounds good. This is great. Roman, Roman taking over was massive. Like that you could feel. Just Roman bought the club and it's like, okay, oh my God. Like we've got this massive rich guy from Russia who like what's going to happen? We don't know, but it, lo it looks good. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't so much Peter Kenyon. It was Jose that mm. because we had seen what he did winning the Champions League with Porto, Porto yeah. just yeah. then, right? And all of a sudden, ah, Chelsea have got him. And I remember Jose from when he beat Man United at Old Trafford and he went down the touchline. That was my first, first. I was like, who is this guy? I didn't know who he was. And I was like, who is this guy? He just looked like a boss, right? Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, oh, that's the guy, like when Chelsea got him, I remember thinking, that's the guy that ran down the touchline at Old Trafford. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was exciting. Um, but it was a massive, massive... Um, that was the moment where you felt massive swagger. Mm -hmm. You felt, oh man, we we look and we feel different now. It's like, you know, it's like looking normal and then you put on the most premium three-piece suit mm -hmm. that costs like five or 10,000 pounds mm -hmm. and you feel like an absolute monster in it. That's what it felt like had happened to Chelsea at that moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, from then the confidence just... Yep. skyrocketed and I can imagine at that time obviously unbeknownst to you that 
at that time, because when you track the history of Jose, he was trying to prove a point. Because remember, I think yeah. it was around the time where it was transitioning, where he was transitioning into coaching and he wanted that Barcelona job. But I think at that time, they were more siding with Pep Guardiola before Pep Guardiola fully took over. Like Barcelona was um, looking for the successor. And they switched from who was supposed to be Jose, not necessarily on the exact time frame, but they were looking at Pep more. So Jose was having this outburst and like, oh, you, I'm not good enough. Into, uh, but if you see the, the history of Jose and Jose Mourinho, it's a good watch. It's a documentary. Uh, it was on Netflix. It is a documentary, documentary you can go watch. But you yep. get to understand why he was that brass, that, you know, that guy. All right, so let's move back here. When Jose took over, what was described to me that first league win? Where the you first? Were just a boy, that first league win. The first league win, yeah. Man United mm-hmm. at the bridge. Mm-hmm. Oh no, sorry. You mean the first the, the the title win, winning the Premier League? I thought yeah. you meant the first win in the Premier League because I remember that day again. I, I'll no, mention no, no, both. Don't skip over that. Don't skip over that. There's, I'll mention both. Know. I'll, yeah, because th- that that Man United at home, Stamford Bridge. That and I, I wasn't I wasn't there at the game for it, obviously. But I remember watching it and thinking. This just feels different. This is not the same Chelsea. This is we've evolved. <laughs> something, something big happened here. Um, beating Man United in that fashion, um, the Good Johnson goal. We remember that was um, that whole game. It just felt like Chelsea had become ruthless. Mm-hmm. You know, Chelsea were always that. Like I said, we had that raw feeling about us. But that day, Jose's first game, the Bridge. Roman, new season, new era. Um, Drogba was on the pitch. Like there was a couple of new signings that were there. And it just, everyone had this look, eye of the tiger. Mm-hmm. It was proper. It was like watching Rocky. Eye of the tiger. I was just like, this is, this is, this energy feels different. This is, we've turned into a little bit of a beast here. So beating Man United that day was fantastic. But that set the tone for the whole season. That whole um, 04, 05 season was just remarkable. Um, immediately off the bat, we just looked like a different beast that no one could get through. This is why, this is this shaped, I believe, that season shaped another level of our DNA. Mm-hmm. Our DNA of n- no one can get through us. Give it your best shot. You're not getting through us. That is the mentality that began to, to, to really come into fruition. And that season was huge for it. We conceded uh, 15 goals in the season. Uh, that, that record is still in place today. No one's touching that again. I believe no one will touch that record. Um, I believe we should have won not just the league. I think we should have won the Champions League that year. I think we were the best team in Europe without, without a doubt. Um, it was just incredible, the whole journey. But winning that league was – that cemented that, yeah, we've we've become the big boys here now. Like, we have taken over. Um, because to do it in that manner, with that mentality, in such a short amount of time, with that swagger, like I said, what Jose did with that team was give us a, a look that made everyone want to be us um, – And everyone was jealous of us, you know, and you could give it your best shot. You ain't going to to, to get through us. You're not going to beat us. You can try. You might as well just give in and try and beat us instead of trying to beat us. You know what I mean? Um, So, yeah, that that Bolton game away where Lampard scored the two goals to, to, to win to win the title. That was just surreal because at one time being younger and i think some other chelsea fans will definitely even the older ones would look and go uh, you just didn't know when it was going to come it didn't feel like it was going to come it's like now with england thinking are we are we going to win something like god knows with chelsea there was that doubt like are we going to win the league at some point you believed you we would but you just didn't know when mm-hmm. but it happened so quickly it felt incredible man incredible to get it done and it set the tone from that point it confirmed everything we're here to take over now. We are, we're no longer that, that almost team. We are the, the team. So, yeah. Well, so what was it like 
just piggybacking off of, of the something you said, we are the big boys now. What's it like transitioning into that big boy? Because it's one thing to win a league title the way we did, but to follow it up with consecutive um, either cup wins or league wins. Yeah. What is that like seeing where Chelsea is coming from transitioning into one of the big boys, not just with league title winning wise, but globally? When you adapt, uh, it became a point in time where other other countries started to adapt. Not just Manchester United and Arsenal, but Chelsea is now a name. Because that's how ma- majority of Jamaica got into supporting Chelsea, um, from yeah. my perspective and my understanding. Firstly, it was Manchester United, Arsenal, but then Chelsea started to win. And and then that's how, we be- that's how I became a fan, and, you know. Like, you know, I think there was one key moment that... I think sent shockwaves for to the rest of Europe that oh no th- these lot are, these lot are serious now like these new these new boys they're not boys they're they're men <laughs> they've they they're a team we didn't really know about but we got to take them seriously and that was when we beat Barcelona at the bridge mm-hmm. that season 4-2 mm-hmm. that I think that sent shockwaves because the way it happened 3-0 after 20 minutes was just it's like you're you're on a trip. Like you, this isn't real. You're having a dream. Like it's it's not real to go three nil up against that Barcelona team. Twenty minutes, um, take the lead in the tie by by a mile, and think, oh my god, we're destroying Barcelona, who had prime Ronaldinho on their team. Mm-hmm. Deco was at its peak. Um, they, they had a they had a top team. Um, to do that so quick was just unbelievable. When they came back into the game and then JT got that fourth goal, it cemented that we won that game. Mm-hmm. That was, I think, the confirmation that we, we're the best. Like, we're not even just, like, coming to, like, trying to get to the top now. We are the top, you know? Yeah, it no. gave that belief. I think that sent shockwaves across Europe. And I think everyone started from that point to take us seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, but that... That transition of becoming that sort of team, it happened so quick, but it's like I said earlier, it happened in style. There was a style, there was a swagger to it. Um, And it was, I go back to that point of the culture because where Chelsea is based, um, where the bridge is, that area, it's it's not a poor area. It's a rich area, right? Mm -hmm. You have that Fulham Road, adjacent to it you have the king's road the king's road is it's it's one of the wealthiest roads in 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 the country <laughs> it's it's you know it's creme de la creme you get there's a standard there and chelsea were delivering that identity on the pitch like we're doing it with style there's a bit of uh jose helped that as well because the way that he spoke and the way that he um he gave the team that belief he would protect the team he would do all these things um and even Jose had that perception then where all the women wanted him and all the men wanted to be him. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was put on the team as well. It was, it was a reflection of what the Chelsea team was as well, where everyone was like, like they, deep down, they wanted to be us. So doing it so quickly in that style is what helped that transition. Just it meant so much. It became so memorable and this is something you can't forget. But that cemented, I think, the tone for Chelsea for years to come. And this is why, this is why, like, we fast forward to now where we're in this pickle and we're in this situation and what's going on. But we have, it's that standard. You, you can't let go of it because of how great it was. You don't want to lower it. Like, it has to stay there. Do you know what I mean? So back then, that transition was everything. It was everything, man. Okay, okay, uh, man. I wish I wish I was more in tuned around that time, but alas, I wasn't. Content creation. How, yeah, I don't, I don't even know where it got started. So you just gotta take me on the journey. Take me on the journey <laughs> to you saying, you know what? <clears throat> I'm a, I'm gonna voice my opinion, and this is what we're gonna do. And then garnering over, eventually garnering over one hundred and I think eighty seven k subscribers on YouTube. Man, you're like a news channel. But I'll let you tell the story and take us to the journey of the content creation. Um, so what you said earlier when we started is true, right? Um, 
I I am one of the OGs. I'm not the first. I'm the second. <laughs> right? And I, I know that I'm the second um, guy to have started this thing properly. Um, I remember starting off. I, I started like YouTube properly in 2011. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't even football. I remember like doing like wrestling stuff, um, WWE stuff back then. Um, and that was really just brief. I was just like a small little hobby. Like, it, it didn't last long. But I remember doing my first football related video and it, it almost came by accident because my first video, I don't know if it's still up. It might actually still be up. It was a, um, a message to Roman to sack AVB. That was my first video. My first football Chelsea related video was that because, um, I remember when we had AVB and I was just like, what is going on? What is this? Right. And I, YouTube was starting to become popular. YouTube was starting to become a thing, you know, where people would watch TV, but now there's this thing online that you can watch videos on. It was a like a monumental moment, right? And it's birth, somewhat birth stage before it was. Ex- exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, it was, it was starting to pick up traction as a, as a popular platform. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? This is a, uh, this could be a way to get like an opinion out to people, right? Mm-hmm. So I was thinking, okay, I want this guy gone. This guy needs to go. Um, what are the chances that maybe someone at Chelsea would end up watching a video? Mm-hmm. So I, I was just like, okay, cool. Let me just do a video. So I'd done my first video on this laptop. I remember I was at uni and it was this laptop and, um, the laptop camera, which was probably operating at 144p. <laughs> That's really, really crap. Pixelated. Pixelated, <laughs> Pixelated as hell, man. Um, and I, I can, I, I remember how it went. And I remember feeling weird because you, you, you're, you're talking to someone, but you're not talking to someone. It's the first experience of talking to plastic. Do you know what I mean? You feel like at, at times you feel like an idiot. You're like, what am I doing? Like, what is this? Um, but I remember doing that. And I, th- it was like, if I'm not mistaken, it was 17 minutes long or something like that. And I, I posted it. Mm-hmm. And back then it done well. I think it got like three or 4,000 views. And back then I was like, oh my God, like what's going on? This is crazy. Like, but, but then that's a lot of views. I was huge back then. I was massive. Like I, I was like, oh my God, like I'm famous. This is mad. <laughs> I was the other <laughs> <person>. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if someone has seen this or, but anyway, um, it started to gain some traction and bit by bit, I, kept posting the same sort of thing from that moment i was like okay chelsea would lose a game it's looking horrible another video okay look this guy's got to go like get rid of this guy man he doesn't know what he's doing and this was the time when avb he was dropping he was dropping jt he was dropping didier he was dropping the big boys because he wanted to show his dominance and everyone was just like what the hell are you doing like you're you've lost the plot um so it developed into a quick not hate, hate is a strong word, but it developed into a quick dislike. Like, you need to get lost. Like, just please go, right? Um, and then when it happened, he got sacked. We lost to Napoli, 3-1 away. Yep. And he got sacked. And I remember coming on, I'd done a video and I was like, okay, mission accomplished. He's out of here. Fantastic. My job here is done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had no intention to keep posting. Um, and then I got a couple of comments, a few comments from people saying, you should like talk about games Mm -hmm. and like do like little reviews. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd never seen it before. I was like, okay, that's an idea. And when I say comments, I'm talking maybe like three or four comments. That's it. But it was the same recommendation. Mm -hmm. You should like talk about games. I was like, okay, cool. So I started doing videos like talking about just reviews just reviews like a game would finish i'll do a review and just give my thoughts on it and that's it right and i wouldn't post for like four or five days another review cool um and then i discovered that i wasn't the only guy doing it 
then I discovered Joe Zecker. Shout out Joe, um, who is I I think now he's he's coming back onto like content properly and all of that. But um, I saw that he was a Chelsea fan doing videos, higher views, and he was there before me. I was like, who is this guy? There's another one. So, um, <laughs> so there's another one. <laughs> there's another one. I thought, I thought it was just me. Um, so I started watching, and then not too long after, we started collabing and we started doing little, little, little uh, videos together. But um, that was the journey. That's how it started. And then I started just again reviews. It went from there, and then transition. Start adding previews. Start bit by bit. It just kept going, and then. That's that's how it all started, really. That's how it all began. Okay, okay, that, yeah. that's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that stood out to me, um, from what you said was the year 2011. Yeah, it was like a, getting sad. you know what I'm gonna ask you about next. What was it like doing content creation around the time when you won the Champions League? Because oh, if I'm not mistaken, that second led to. The temporary appointment and that temporary appointment led to one of the marquee nights in Chelsea's history. The lo- right. And we did it in Bayern Munich's backyard that yeah. season. Come on, man. You got to talk to me about that. I couldn't. Like, yeah, that, that, to go from AVB to European champions in such a short time. Was again biggest roller coaster, man. We did things with roller coaster rides, like it was just so <laughs> up and down, it was crazy. Um, but yeah, to to do like content, the the semi final was where like I had my first real big exciting video. Like, what is going on? Um, we when we beat Barcelona at the New Camp. Mm-hmm. Oh well, we drew, but we beat them and we knocked them out. I watched that at uni. I was at my uni bar. Mm-hmm. We had a student bar like, at, at my university and we were inside and I was watching. And it was rammed. Chelsea fans. Um, and there was two Barcelona fans. Just two, right? Mm-hmm. And they were giving it the big and like after like Iniesta scored, jo- John Terry got sent off. They started to get a little bit like, ah, and then just like looking at everyone like they're, like they're cattle. Mm-hmm. Um, and that Torres goal, I never forget it. Um, I've never seen a place explode in that manner, even to this day. I've, there's been places that have exploded, but the way that it exploded in there was just uh, un- unbelievable. Chairs flying, tables flying. Those two Barcelona fans, the fan Chelsea fans, went up to them and started pouring beers on them, <laughs> like <laughs> because they were talking. They were talking, you know, smack before. So when Torres scored, part of the celebration, I looked, turned back. Security came in because they thought something had happened. It wasn't. It was just Torres scored. And the place went crazy. And the two Barcelona fans were just drenched. And then they walked out. They left. Um, so <laughs> that was that. But I went back after that straight to do a video. That was my first experience of, I've got to do a video. This is a huge win. Oh, my God. And I just pure jubilation and excitement. Um, that was unbelievable. And um, I, I lost my voice. Like the, the video that I'd done, that was like half of my voice was gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't, there wasn't any analysis. Like, you know, now we try to get into analysis. We try to, you know, pick moments and like what you've read during the game. There wasn't any of that. Mm-hmm. It was just, we're in the Champions League final. This is, oh my God, we've gone crazy. Like, this is unbelievable. That's all it was. Um, the final... I remember I'd, I'd gone back home. I wasn't watching this at uni. I was watching this at home. Um, again, with my dad and my best friend at the time. And we'd watched it. I didn't do a video straight after. I traveled after, after that game, went back to uni. The next day, I put a video up. Um, and back then, obviously, being in the circumstances you're in, you've got to watch out. Like, you don't want to wake people up. Like, you don't want to... You have to manage your sound. There wasn't any mics. Like, it was just raw. You know, switch something on and just start talking. So... It was a really weird, like really happy video where I wanted to be loud, but I had to keep my voice down. Mm-hmm. Um, so going going through all of that, the, creating that sort of content at that time um, was just pure emotion. No analysis, pure emotion, just jubilation. I couldn't believe it. 
Like we'd won the Champions League. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the point that I mentioned earlier, where no one expected for us to win the league. No one expected to win the Champions League. That was like that's yeah, yeah, that's yeah, not going to happen. We were not supposed to be anywhere near that. It wasn't. But what what meant more about that year? Everyone knew it was the last chance for that team. Mm -hmm. So for JT, for Lamps, for Didier, for Czech, for Ashley Cole, for Essien, like these, it was their last opportunity because we'd been through what we'd been through. We should have won it in 05. We got robbed, ghost goal. Mm -hmm. We could have won it in 07, got knocked out on penalties. We got robbed in 2009. We all remember Barcelona and that's why the semi-final meant more because that was revenge. Mm -hmm. Um, we had those chances to win it and we were almost there for whatever reason it just never happened so brilliant <laughs> apologies for that um, but it was we were almost there so for that team we knew like this is it this is the last opportunity if it doesn't happen this year it's not going to happen and they deserve to win the Champions League they, they were European champions man they had to so that meant more that meant more yeah, I remember after Drogba taking that penalty, tears immediately. Like it's like he was crying before he took the penalty because he knew he would score. But then exactly him wheeling away and then falling to his knees, and then when you look at Frank Lampard's face, you can see that the hard man mentality. But you know he's crying yeah. behind those behind the, that emotion. The fan that came on the pitch, like uh, there was a couple of fans that came on, and Lamps went to like hug them and all of that. Like yeah, crazy, yeah. crazy scenes. Absolutely crazy. What point? At what point did you realize that this content creation thing is much more than a hobby? It's no, it's no. Uh, I don't want to say responsibility, but. Mm. At what point do you did you realize that content creation thing? Oh, this is more than a hobby now. This is this actually is a thing. A thing. Um, for me, uh, for me, there were two moments. So the first moment was 2014. Mm -hmm. 2014. Um, and I don't know if you remember this or if you've seen, but when I was on 100% Chelsea. And when 100% Chelsea started as as a brand new channel, and the whole the whole aim was to try and like replicate the success that AFTV had, but in the Chelsea space. In the Chelsea space. Um, and even back then, I was like talking. This was in like collaboration with Robbie uh, and, and doing all of that back then to try and get something Chelsea related started. That was the first moment where I was like, this content creation thing could turn into something bigger not just a hobby this could become like a job or something like it could it could happen especially after seeing how AFTV were, were, were going and it wasn't just to like copy but it was to try and have a same sort of concept in the Chelsea space and to give yeah. Chelsea fans a voice and uh, I was like there's, there's there's a market for it for sure that was the first inkling of yeah content creating could become a thing not just like a little hobby on the side talking about games and that's it um that was the first moment after that where for me it didn't work out for me i had to pull away from it it still existed after me but i pulled away from various circumstances i had so, so much going on um with studying work home my dad wasn't well all of that it, it, it was it was all of that kicking off so i pulled away but not too long after I say not too long after, but 20, 27, 2016, 2017, 2016, actually, um, was when I was doing videos on my channel again properly. Mm -hmm. I'd given full focus to 100% Chelsea. I, I basically abandoned my channel. Mm -hmm. um, when I started doing things on my channel again, um, that's when I started getting my first checks, right? And I remember I was part of, um, my, the, my channel was part of a, a network called Maker Studios back then. And Baker Studios were collabed with or run by Disney, I think. Mm -hmm. So they were doing like multi-channel networks at the time, MCNs. And um, depending on like how many views I would get, um, how much ad revenue I generate, I would get sent a check, right? So it's not like now where you get things paid to you direct, but back then you'd get checks. So 
I remember like in the mail, I'd get my a check and I'd be like, oh my, this has come from the United States, from 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 Maker Studios. And I'm just like, okay, open it up. And there's like a check there for like $40 or like $35 or something, something really small. Um, and that's when I was like, this could become a thing where you're earning from it. And, you know, it's not just a, a hobby on the side, but you're doing the same thing, but getting some money for it. That was the first, the f again, independently. So not like part of something with other people, but independently, just me, my channel. That was another point where I was thinking, yeah, this could be a thing, you know. Um, but with that channel, it never really happened. It never really took off in, in, in that manner. Um, and now I look back, I know why. I was doing many things wrong, <laughs> many things wrong. But that was one of the moments that, yeah, I felt like this could be a thing. So, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's nice to know. So at, at that point, you're like, huh, I could, I could take this to the next level. Light bulb. Yeah. Unistarks football. I noticed you, 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 the title of your channel, it's just you talking about football in general. Why not Chelsea specific? Because. I think that's a question that people want to know. Why why isn't like Eunice talks about Chelsea or Eunice got AVB fired or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to I don't want to tie my entire reputation to that. <laughs> I'm like responsible for one man sacking. Like no. Um but I need well AV it's funny now, now I look back at AVB I smile like every time I see AVB pop up he's the president of Porto now when he got that that Porto president gig what <laughs> I, yeah I know I know I saw that I was like you know I'm happy for you I'm actually happy for you man <laughs> like, um yeah good luck to him um but no my my whole the whole concept the whole point was it was never to just specifically talk about only Chelsea right the, the the aim was to 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 try and broaden out and talk about other things too right and which is i i've introduced it as a thing where in many videos part of it will be about what's going on elsewhere and what's happening or if something big happens elsewhere i'll mention it and i'll talk about it it was because of that if it was a chelsea channel i wouldn't be able to do that it wouldn't fit the target audience it just wouldn't fit the viewer um, but if it's a bit broadened, it gives you the space to be able to talk about other things when when it's happening. Um, so that was the whole the whole reason why I was like, okay, I, I was thinking, what should I call it, right? Because I didn't, I, I wanted to, I wanted to create a new name. I was just like, just keep it simple to the point. I talk football. Okay. So okay. Eunice talks football, and that's <laughs> basically where it came nice. from. <laughs> nice, yeah. nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Nice. What are some of the high moments in, in this content creation space? Because you've been around for a while in this space. What was the top where you said, you know what? I didn't expect this journey to take me here. And I'm forever grateful for it. Like for me, if, 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 if all goes well for me, it's getting on like a BBC or a Sky. Because after I get on that, it's over, my friend. I'm going to have to address me <laughs> differently at that point. <laughs> no, uh, no, you're right. Um, for me, a hundred thousand subs. So getting the, the silver button so the silver play button was when I was like, yeah, I've got it here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hang on. Get to see that silver button people. There we are. Hey, there we go. Yeah. It all started by getting someone sacked. I, I, I owe it to AVB. Thank you, AVB. <laughs> we got him sacked. We got him sacked. One more block. <laughs> let me down, let me down. No, but um, what, what was crazy, um, like when that happened, when I got to 100,000, I knew this was serious. I was like, okay, this isn't a small channel now. Like this is... This is something. This is substantial. It's not blockbuster. Obviously, you, there's, there's so many that are so far ahead. Mm -hmm. um, you, we've seen what like Cristiano Ronaldo done. He joined and YouTube then, two weeks. He's on 60 million. I was like, it's, it's, it's insane. It's insane. It's ridiculous. Um, but that was the moment where you see something in the flesh, like, like, like the play button. And you're like, mm -hmm. I'm holding this. Like, it was also a case of like, 
I managed to do that. You know what I mean? It wasn't a sense of, of, of accomplishment. Um, so that's when I realized, yeah, this is, this is something serious and substantial. Now we've got something big to play with. Um, yeah. and you have to take it seriously. So, um, that was, that was the whole, the whole point, but I would say this is a whole culmination of all the years because the way Eunice talks football became what it is now is because of everything that I went through prior to Eunice talks football. When I, I stopped uploading from 2019 into 2020, I stopped a good, like six months. I came off YouTube. I came off the platform. Um, and I was contemplating and going, I just, I'm just not feeling it. Right. And that's, that was a good thing and a bad thing because now I look back now I know you don't let your feelings dictate what you need to do. You just do what you know you have to do. But that break also did start up like a complete reflection for me. And when I, I got new equipment and everything at home and I remember, and I was thinking, and I, I, I remember I spoke to my dad about this and my dad was, um, my dad was the one that saw me not uploading, not doing anything. And he was like, what are you doing? I was like, what, what do you mean? He's like, you're, you've got all this stuff here. It's brand new. You're good to go. You were doing it for so long. Now you've stopped. Like, what are you doing? You're good at this. Like, go for it. Do it. Like, don't hold on. Don't hold back. That was the kick up the backside I needed because at that point I spent a little bit of time and I told myself, okay, I'm going to start again. Like I still had my channel, mm -hmm. my Eunice HH channel, which was 30,000 subs, mm -hmm. but it was 30,000 across seven years. It was slow, very slow, right? I made all sorts of mistakes on there and, and I, I, probably, I probably messed the algorithm up, right? Because of how messed up it was. But I remember telling myself, okay, look, we're, let's start again from zero and let's do it properly. From day one, it's like I said earlier, the standard has to be high. Set the standard high from day one and don't let it drop. Mm -hmm. um, the quality on the camera needs to be on point. The sound needs to be on point. Any lighting needs to be on point. The, the content itself and the way I deliver needs to be on point. The thumbnails need to be on point. The titles need to, I was like, do everything perfectly from day one. And what helped me, this is why I said earlier, this channel and where it is now is an accumulation of not just 2020 up until now, but before that and my old channel too, because I posted a video on my old channel letting people know I've got a new channel, right? So I'm going to be uploading on there, not here anymore. What that did is, and the OGs will remember that video, it will, what it did, it sent, I think a good 10,000 from that channel over to my new channel. Mm -hmm. And that triggered the algorithm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting it to, but it triggered the algorithm. And that's when I realized, okay, I, in, in two weeks, I think I ended up on 10,000 subs. I was like, this is crazy. Like, this is mental. For me, I was like, I didn't expect that. I expected a bit, but not that. Mm -hmm. And I rode the wave. The algorithm started working in my favor and I just rode the wave. And that's where I was like, okay, keep the standard high. Upload, 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 upload. Don't let go. And I was doing that. And I've not stopped <laughs> basically since. Um, so to get to 100,000, it took me on that channel uh, two and a half, two and a half years, two, two years, two and a half years well, um, to get to 100. Well, that. Yeah, that's where I knew I've got something bigger. So, yeah, yeah, and to be to be here as one of your fans, as one of someone that watches your channel, you 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 do have something special. Um, which leads me to my next question: Do you feel like you have a responsibility to the fan base? In terms of like being there, and being present. Yes, yeah. but more so, what if what yours if what you say carries weight? So. In the sense that, hey, this is how I'm feeling about a specific topic, but because mm. I have a responsibility to the fan base, do I have to kind of dress up how I say things or do I just say it cut, raw, and dry and people need to use their brain to interpret what I'm saying? No, I, I, I think I do have a responsibility to be present the way that I felt like I'm, I'm here all the time. Mm 
So I do, f every, any time, this happened recently, but any time I don't upload for a certain amount of time, I, I feel like, ah, man, I, I feel like I'm leaving people behind it. Like, or I, I'm, I'm letting them a bit dry. Do you know what I mean? It, it's, it, that, does, that does creep in. But in terms of what I say, I've set the tone from the beginning. And this is something that I, I, I knew that I, I had to do just because of who I am, right? Everyone's different. So this doesn't apply to everybody. But for me, um, I set the tone of being raw and honest with whatever from the beginning. So when people watch me, they know that they're getting just complete honesty from me. Mm -hmm. Even if I end up being right or I'm wrong on whatever, but they know that I'm real. That's the most important thing for me. Like, so I don't sugarcoat or try and give perceptions just for the sake of trying to maybe safeguard something, or I know there's a good amount of viewers here, so I got to be careful how I deliver this. Like I've always set the tone of, no, I will deliver the way I'm just going to deliver. And people, people, people know that this is, which is why, and I truly believe this. I, I feel like I have one of the best communities in the comment section mm -hmm. on my channel because um, everyone is just like, they know what they're getting. It's straight to the point. There's complete honesty. You can agree or disagree, which is why each video I always say after every single opinion or piece of news or whatever, I always ask, if you're in the comments, let me know. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let me know. What you I always <laughs> say, though, because I'm happy for that to be a thing in the comment section. And everyone is so cool about it. Um, in, in my comments that you actually get a really good engaging conversation in the comment section and it's never too extreme. It's always, there's always a nice balance going on. So um, that's where, yeah, I, I, I felt like I've set the tone from the beginning, no matter how big the channel gets, that I'm just going to say things the way that I'm going to say it. And I, I'm, I don't want to be a hypocrite either and like pretend to be real just for, the, to, for that image, like, no, like what you hear from me is genuinely what I think. And that's all I would say. Do you know what I mean? So that's, that's the tone. Yeah. I know I kind of deemed you the pioneer of this Chelsea content creation thing. Would you believe that to be so true? Would you believe that to be true? And would you believe you're the, you're one of the first or most successful content creators to do this? Not necessarily, subscribers wise but you paved the way for the rest um it's a good question because i am i responsible for other people coming onto the platform probably not maybe to an extent maybe if there's people that have seen my videos or they've seen others at that time um i think there's maybe a knock-on effect perhaps yeah like like i said back then when i started there was there was joe zeka there was myself and then not too long after and he's still active son of chelsea daniel right he came after that's the, that was the chelsea space that was all that existed <laughs> basically so i don't know if content creators that are on there now saw that stuff back then and that gave them ideas to come on and start talking about their opinions and their, their thoughts too, maybe. But I, I do think that YouTube as a whole just became bigger. And I do feel like um, it's not necessarily just down to me or anyone that was active back then, but um, it might have helped. It might have influenced a bit, but YouTube as a whole just became huge where I do think people started to realize what we realized earlier which is there is this platform. It is big. There is a way to make something out of it. Um, the football space started to become bigger and bigger. Mm. And that's where I think each has their own moment of, I'm going to start doing videos because they've just seen videos as a whole. Uh, Nini is one specifically as well, because he's been active for a little while. He came after, but he's also now seen as someone that's a bit old school he was active from if i'm not mistaken from the conte days mm -hmm. um i remember him, him pop up so yeah he, everyone has their moment and everyone has their their catalyst mm -hmm. um but am i 
responsible for like the Chelsea space. I, I don't think so as a whole. I must but stop you right I, there, but you. I played a part. You're too I've humble. You're, you're too humble. If it was me, you best leave. <laughs> say it with your chest, Judas. Say it with your chest. I'm the pioneer. I'm nah. Christopher Columbus with the Chelsea space. What are you talking about? What, on, no, what, what I will say, what I will say with chest is I've been active for this long, mm -hmm. right? And longer than most. Like I've said, only one person has been there longer than me, right? Mm -hmm. And I've... And even like what I will say, even like Joe, who was there first, he came off the platform for a good amount of time. Mm -hmm. I've not left. Like I've from from then until now, I've been here. You know what I mean? So I've seen it all. <laughs> running. That, running. That's something that I'm genuinely um, I am proud of, and I think it again. It's a reason why this exists because the consistency was there. No matter what, the consistency has been there, yeah, and that I'm definitely. I look back and I go, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm one of um, maybe the very, very few mm -hmm. that will be able to say I've been there for that long. Yeah. Um, so for that, I'll say it with chest, hundred percent. But being being like a, a pioneer in the space, yeah, I think I've had some influence mm -hmm. for sure. No, when but, you talk to other people, they definitely mention your name first, especially when yeah. you get started. Um, so I'm I'm dubbing you the pioneer. Who am I? I'm nobody. I'm just 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 I'm starting out myself. So yeah, you have to understand. But when you when you talk to these people, you're one of the names that come up first. Let me ask you another question. What's one player that you resonate with now with the squad? If any. It's okay to say Ooh. no. That I resonate with. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily resonate, but someone you like. I mean, Cole Palmer is Cole Palmer, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Cole Palmer is the one guy in the team that I look at and go, you are Chelsea level. I've got no doubts. You are it. Like, I can go to bed at night and sleep in peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with, with Cole Palmer, <laughs> zero concern. Zero. Um, so I would say for, for now, Cole Palmer for sure. Um, because it's like I said at the beginning, I, I'm someone, and a lot of people know me for this. I, I never want the standards to drop. I never want it to slip. Yeah. And I understand that there's factors and there's circumstances and like right now, Chelsea are not there, but that's what you have to strive for. That is what you need to have as your benchmark. You yeah, know what I mean? Hold the bar um, here and even if have you hold the bar every time you still strive to get to that bar. Exactly. You can never be satisfied with a little bit. You can celebrate your little wins without a doubt, but you can never be satisfied up until when you know you're at that bar again. We're not at that bar yet. We're not, we're not, we're not near yet. So when I, when I look at Cole Palmer, I get reminded of a player that is at that level. Mm -hmm. He is at that standard. I've got no problem. Like Cole Palmer, that's why I, I resonate. I would say resonate. Mm -hmm. That's the right word um, with him. I think there are others, but it's just, it's unfortunate. I mean, Rhys James, for example, I love Rhys James, mm -hmm. but it's unfortunate. We see what's happening with Rhys at the moment. It's mm -hmm. it, like, if, if, if he wasn't going through the, these spells of injury, yeah. he'd be the best right back in the world, I reckon. Easily, easily. Easily. Got a shot on him, got the pass on him, got the physicality, can Man. defend, hey, easily. Is it'd, be, it'd, it'd be insane. And it was heading in that direction. Remember the whole Reese Trent, like mm -hmm. debates and, and all of that. Um, of that. Real Madrid were interested. We know that. Like, of course they were, you know, that, that, so again, someone like Reese, I look at and I think, and it does touch a little more that he came from the Academy. Um, it does add a little bit of spice um, into the mix because it feels like your own. Um, so that's that was nice too. Apart from that, honestly, there are some really good players in there. Um, but like you said, to resonate, that will take time because this is a new team. There's a lot of young boys. Um, it's it's not going to come overnight with these guys for sure. So that will take time. But the ones that I mentioned are yeah, the ones that I you genuinely have a good resonation with. 
Boy, Eunice, I have a lot more questions. We're probably going to have to do a part two or something because... Hey, no problem. <laughs> fire time, away. Fire away, man. This time, is cool. <laughs> time, time, is, time is running long. Um, <clears throat> something struck out to me that, that I wanted to ask you because you've been there. I don't want to ask this question because it could go along, but I'll ask it anyways. Take us to what it was being at the start of the Eden Hazards tint to the end of it. What was it like being a, a fan of Chelsea during that time and making content out like this guy? What, what, what was it like? Because let me give you an example. Like for me, it was so good, but I still feel like he still could have gave us more. I what, agree. Just, let me not take over. What, what do you think? What do you think? I, I agree. Um, but I'll, I'll give you the timeline. When um, when he joined, there was the rumor of this player, this Eden Hazard, like Chelsea, Chelsea are looking at him. Um, and you see clips of him at Lille, where he was at Lille at the time. And mm-hmm. you're looking and going, he looks a player. Like mm-hmm. this, this guy looks fantastic. But there was a lot of demand, right? When he put out that tweet, I've never seen anything like that. I don't think anyone's done it. And I don't think anyone ever will do it again. But when he put out a tweet saying, I'm joining the Champions League winners... <laughs> <laughs> such a boss tweet right and twitter had only just really gained like traction back then um so when he when he um when he tweeted that it was like oh my god that's that's such a boss move to make but when you joined you saw the impact immediately you could just see like what type of player he was you know little magician and that's where the zola comparison started coming out immediately Mm-hmm. immediately because Chelsea didn't have a player um, like Zola since Zola mm-hmm. um, and we had some similarities like an Iron Robin a Duff they never really made it. They never but they really were never it. really yeah they were never that that type of player like Zola the way that he moved Eden Hazard rocked up and it's like oh my god like this is almost a carbon copy mm-hmm. but it's in its own way mm-hmm. so Seeing him playing the way that he was moving and the impact that he had, even in his first season, was great. Um, what was fantastic, and I remember pointing this out, after Jose came back, we had that summer. And when we started that season, you could see that he put on size, but in a, in a good way. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't so thin anymore. You could see that he would gain some some size and some strength. Yeah, some mass. And I'm like, how is this going to work? He he's looking heavier. Is it going to is it going to impact his game? Is he going to slow down? Like we don't want him slowing down. He got quicker as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but did, this time with a lower center of gravity, with a bit more strength, he became more powerful. And that's where I was like, oh man, this this guy, this this guy is special now. Um but I agree with what you said. Now we know, and we look back, we know why, but he could have done more. Mm-hmm. I was looking at Eden Hazard and thinking he should be someone willing the Ballon d'Or. Right? He yeah. should. Like, there's no debate. At, I was looking at it thinking, you have all this talent. Why, do you, why aren't you top goal scorer? Why aren't you doing for us what Messi and Ronaldo is doing in La Liga? Why and- aren't you dominating English football hands down? Because he was doing it with the dribbling and the assist. But when you're not getting consistent top goal scorer, scorer yeah. there leaves there is what leaves room for the Salah debates. There's and Salah is exactly comfortably clear now. You can't argue with that. Um, that's what leaves room for anybody else. Oh, you know how I did this, but when you look at the stats, because people are going to reflect on stats versus the eye test, it leaves room for that. And I'm like, man. I understand that we didn't necessarily put the pieces around you, but you still had the talent talents to do this week in, week out. And this is why. This is why, like, if you ask me, the stats won't won't back it up, but you ask me who's the better player, Hazard or Salah? I'm saying Hazard all day long. I'm not just saying that because of, of, of Chelsea. Like as a player, what this guy is capable of, mm-hmm. band, he, he was mad. But he never pushed himself. To the level that a Cristiano did. Or a Messi was just seriously, naturally gifted, but he made it work even more, right? Mm. Um, His consistency was stupid. But Eden Hazard, 
and we know this now. Now we look back and we know we've heard him talk and we've heard teammates talk and we've, we've seen. He was lazy. Mm -hmm. He was lazy, right? You, it makes you think that if he wasn't lazy and if he worked super hard, he was a sort of guy like John Terry. I remember John Terry giving a, a story where um, Eden Hazard was on FaceTime to someone in the dressing room. And it was five minutes before the, the boys were meant to go out, you know, to go and kick off. He hadn't even got changed yet. Mm -hmm. Like he was just sat there like, on, and J JT was like, listen, there's five minutes, Cut, hurry up. You've got to get going. And he got it done in that five minutes, but then he goes out and he plays and he scores like two goals or, you know, he saves the team and it's like, okay, just let him do his thing because it, it works. So it, Ronaldinho had the same thing, but Ronaldinho was a little bit more advanced. He was a lazy player. There are these players that are just lazy. And I think Eden Hazard, if he had pushed himself he would be in the com he would have been in the conversation at that time with prime ronaldo prime messi i think for sure and especially in the premier league at that time that would have given him an advantage but when you hear den hazard talk and he said it back then too his interest was just helping the team mm -hmm. like he didn't really want to do anything for himself he was like i'm just here to help my team and that's it and and he did and that was his goal he accomplished that but that's all he wanted. So it does raise the question, if he wanted more, yeah, I reckon he could have. But seeing Eden Hazard go through all of that and what he did under all those managers, under Jose, under Conte, under Sari, and that was the season where he really came out of his shell because he was, I said, given more license to attack even further and to express himself even more. Um his legacy at Chelsea is intact, for sure. And what he'd done was, was incredible. Incredible. For sure. The reason why I said Salah, um, it's clear, was because of the stats-wise. I test is always going to... I test will always tell you Eden Hazard. Like, I remember one of my favorite quotes um, from... I think it was from JT, um, was when we were... I think it was nil-nil at halftime or we were down at halftime to West Ham. <laughs> and he might have just given the team talk. He said, as I got up and said, why are we doing all these tactics for West Ham? It's West Ham. Just give it a ball. <laughs> <laughs> and he went off the second half and he scored two goals and they won the game. And it's, 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 it's crazy how elite his level of um, talent was. I just wish he worked harder to, you know, really leave no room for doubt. Um, one of my final questions here for you is if you could sit down and we didn't even get into the what you think about the mother the mother about the new takeover and the new ownership and whatever oh, 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 oh. We're that's, a whole, that's a whole different conversation <laughs> conversation we're in a short time but i st i'm still permitted to ask this question Go for it. if you could sit down with the new board given what you've seen and given your um what you've seen over the years from pre-roman Roman and now post Roman, if you could sit down with the board, what would be your first question and what would be your rebuttal to what they've done? My, um, would I have a question? I, I don't think I would have things to say. I don't think I'd have a question because I think it's clear what's being done. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm, I mean, I'm in no doubt. And other clubs have been examples in the past, but money in, is at the forefront here. It's, a, it's, it's being run as a business first, not a football club first. And in the modern day, there are some people that will say that's necessary. I believe there's a balance that's needed between the two. And so, so what I would say, I would, I would... Okay, if we needed a question, I would say, do you not think it would be beneficial... Two, balance out the business with the football side equally, 50-50, and give dominance to both sides because both need it e as equally as each other. Because I, I think that's the disparity that we have at the club at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, there's much more money focus than there is football focus. Mm -hmm. um, and if whatever we are doing on the football side, a lot of it comes out of hope for what will come in the near future maybe like in three, four years, rather than actually right now. Um, so that would be, if I had to ask a question, that would be <laughs> that. Would be that. The rebuttal is, is simply what we've seen already. And I would just try and double down on not making everything about the pound note and money um, 
as, as important as it is, like I said, there needs to be a balance. I think Man City have this perfectly. Mm-hmm. Man City have the balance perfectly. Mm-hmm. And they've nailed this before and they've mentioned it before publicly. The football side is, is as important as the business side and the business side is as important as the football side. And I think Man City have the balance between both. They don't let the quality in the team drop. They get exactly what the team needs for now whilst also preparing for what will be needed later. Mm-hmm. So they do incorporate the best young players to come through. Real Madrid are another example. But they go for the creme de la creme, not just anyone that the data says is going to be fantastic. But they also back those young players up with the quality that have to get the job done now. Mm-hmm. And that only aids. And I look at... Man United over the years when Sir Alex Ferguson was there and they'd done this flawlessly. If you if you look at Man United on the footballing side, you never realised when they were in transition. Mm-hmm. Until when you're five years down the line, the team is completely different to what it was, but they're, they're still operating at the top. It was flawless. Mm-hmm. Players would come in and go very, you know, sporadically, in a, but not, they wouldn't do so in one go, in one massive transition. It would be one in, one out, and then go a little bit more, and then one in, one out, a little bit more. And then the standard stays high, the quality is high, but you're getting a couple of young players in. They're learning. There's players that are getting the job done for you. And then it just it keeps going that way. Man City have that balance um, right now. And I just feel like we've got all the resources. What, 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 what winds me up about Chelsea and what we've done, if we didn't have resource... I'd be like, okay, we've got to try and think smartly about everything. But when you have the resource and you splash as much as we've splashed, yeah, to the point where other teams, even City are going, what are they doing, right? 1.2 or 1.3 billion spent, what you could do with that money is, again, we would go back to the accusations that we had when Roman took over, that we've bought everything, you know? No one can say that now because we've, We've spent that money, but we've not spent it to, to like to win now. Um, so this is where I would I would honestly put the emphasis down on the importance of having the football and the business side run equally um, and dominance given to both, not one over the other. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that that that's definitely understandable. Again, first my my first question would be why why do you hate us, and then secondly. <laughs> 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 and then secondly who I'm sent married. you why are you destroying us what's your aim what's your what motive do to you <laughs> and then i would um have a whole business plan on how to run this thing properly because it's not that difficult i wouldn't go into get into granular details because there's they're billionaires and i don't want to look like a fool in terms of billionaire but overarching points you know to seem somewhat knowledgeable but yeah you just no. And this is this is just to really briefly mention. That's a good point you just made. Um, on a money level, on a business level, yeah, these guys, these guys are at a level that they're at. They're not stupid. They know what they're doing on a money level to get to that situation, right? And their track record, I'm sure, speaks for itself. You don't get there lucky. You have to know what you're doing. Um, but on a football level, nah, like they ain't ready. Don't they're tell me, that, don't tell me that, they're, that they're ready or they know <laughs> as much as they do on the money side. No, 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 no. So this is where the disparity is. That's the mistake. So it, it doubles down and why when we get Win Stanley and Stewart or guys like this, why it's like, what are we doing? Because if you would got people, so I've heard this before. Some people say, uh, Roman didn't know much about football when he took over. No. Yeah, well, he didn't. True. He just got the best did. He knew football, I think, better than than what these guys have, right? Because he was already watching and in love with the sport on some degree. And he was contemplating buying a football club because he wanted to buy a football club. He wa- it wasn't about money. He wanted to have a football club to win, right? And he chose between Chelsea and Tottenham. We know the story between Chelsea and Tottenham. Sven, who just passed away, was a big reason as to why he chose Chelsea. But um, when he came in, the first thing... Peter Kenyon, Mm -hmm. you get the biggest football mind that exists to come into the club. Okay, I'm going to trust you. You do your thing. That's it. And and you know what kind of gripes me about all of this? Remember when Ineos took over Manchester United? 
Didn't they go yeah. get uh, someone that was in integral to cities? And um, city. They got that's Omar the first, What's the? F that's the first thing they did. I'm like, geez, flipping hell, man. Yeah. Why can't we do this? And and time will show how that's going to go for United as well. Because Omar Barada is a very smart person. Like, if, if Chelsea had got someone like Omar Barada, I'd be like, yep, I, I trust him. did get Joe Shields, so that's something. But it's a different role. It's so, like, if, 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 if Joe Shields got promoted mm -hmm. from head of recruitment, or what, that, he's, he's head of recruitment, I think he is. Yeah, and something to do with the youth team as well. Exactly. If, if he got promoted, he's sporting director, I'd feel a lot more at ease than I do with the others. Because too, even now... Me too, me too, me too. No, I, I, I only mentioned Joe Shields because I'm looking for some positive. <laughs> you know, I'm looking, yeah. I'm looking for some positive. I'm looking for some positive. Yeah, at least you got Joe Shields. That, that, that's all I can give him. And I'm not saying these sporting directors are, are horrible because they did find some good... They did find some good buys. But, you know, I would, would, I would have preferred someone at a... Someone, one person at a higher level, at a higher standard. Exactly. You know? exactly. Not someone... Not, not two people that are essentially coming from a mold where they have to use the scraps of money they had per se to find the best talent and someone, okay, I've been here, I've I've had the money to spend and I've actually brought in big talent and I know how to operate in bringing in big talent, not just going out and splashing the cash for big talent um, and bringing in, I know people have their gripes with, um, with um, what's her name? Marina. Uh, Marina, but I, I still think she did somewhat of a better job that these guys are doing now. But that's my opinion, and I'll put that out in a, in a separate podcast later. I but agree. yeah, Yunus, I won't take up any more of your time. Thanks for stopping over at the Final Whistle Podcast. Let the people know where to find you if they don't know where to find you. Nah, bro, thank you for having me, man. And um, yeah, it's like we said, there's so much more that we could get into. Um, Part but two, this maybe? We, we can do a part two at some point. Why not? It is, it is, I, think it, I think it's needed. <laughs> so, um, no, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it, man. And I um, hope everyone has enjoyed it. Um, if you don't know, then you can catch me at Eunice Talks Football. And um, I'll give, I always give my thoughts and opinions on all sorts of things that are happening, not just at Chelsea, Chelsea mainly, but elsewhere too. Reviews, previews, the whole shebang in the midst of the season now is going to get tasty. So, Loads to be dropping on there. So, but that's where you can find me. And once again, thanks for having me, man. It's been a pleasure. No problem. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. I keep forgetting to say this in the middle of the thing. Always I say don't, it. I don't, I, don't want to, I don't ever want to cut our guests. And, you know, just remember to like, share, subscribe. The road now is to a, to 500 subscribers. Almost there. I mean, like, I've always said it. Get, Get me to 1,000 and I'm elated. So, <laughs> thank you guys for joining us on the Final Whistle Podcast. Peace.